call to order. We're good. All right. So uh, approval of the agenda is the first thing on our agenda. How does everyone feel about that? Looks good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> We have a motion. I move approval of the agenda. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Yep. Agenda approved. Comments from the chair. So I have a few notes. I let Mike know about some of these, so hopefully um, he's up to speed and doesn't need to hear this. So we, uh, I brought a copy of Leslie's letter. Did everyone see that? Does everyone have that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, wait. I think we do. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah. So, kind of for everyone's information, it's as far as whatever, I think as far as we're all concerned, it's final. But but there, so everyone sees what's going out. One notable aspect of it, though, is that it has the August 13th date for uh, the meeting, but I have not heard back from the schools um, that, that that date's okay. They were supposed to check in to it to make sure that there's no other conflict going on. I haven't heard back. I called today, tried to email a couple different people today to follow up to try to get an answer for this meeting, but I did not. Is there the possibility we could go to someplace like the pavilion? I think it's I'm going to work with Leslie tomorrow, and if I can't hear from the school to, to verify that it's fine, try to get another venue real quick tomorrow. And we'll just let all of you know. But uh, we don't want to hold this up, so if, if the venue gets changed last minute, we'll just go ahead and change it on the letter and have it go out. Um, and Mike, are you able to um, are you able to, to plug in the information to the committees and build us to? Yeah, to if we've got as long as it's ready to go, we can okay. work to get that. So, so Leslie or I will get in touch with you tomorrow about the venue to confirm one way or another, and then um, hopefully try to get it out tomorrow. Um, one note that Leslie had, Mike, was for your memo. She requested that you put memo across the top. And when I say Mike's memo, do you remember what was emailed around this week uh, explaining the maintain, evolve, transform stuff? Um, so, so did you catch that, Mike, to yep. put memo across the top and put that with the letter when we sent it out? OK. Uh, Another note I have is uh, that there's the design review open house. Did everyone see that on Thursday the 12th, 4.30 to 7? So um, I plan to stop in on that one. So they have, they have their draft document? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, because I was sort of wondering if that would be attached to the invitation. Mm -hmm. Do you know, Mike? It wasn't from what I saw. This is the preservation. Sign reviews. It is just a little different. Oh, okay. I Historic preservation is the planning side of the design review committee, kind of. So the HPC is a completely different group. So which one is coming? Which one is having their meeting? Design um, review. Just design review. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I was half. Have following that. I'm a little I'm a little foggy on what they do all the time, so I mean I plan to stop in and kind of ask. Like, What's the date again? I know I have Thursday the twelfth, four thirty the seventh. Yeah, I have historic preservation open house, and that's probably. Yes, the historic preservation open house. Oh, it's a historic. It is historic preservation. It's historic preservation, and they're also re design review. They're reviewing design review standards. Oh, for, for the historic, historic preservation. For the historic preservation. Which is what they were putting okay. together to be included in the zoning, right? Yes. Technically? Yes. Okay. So they, that was the, do they have a document? Uh, I believe they're working on a draft one. I don't know if it's out and available yet or whether that's what they're presenting. Oh, okay. So they're going to actually have a presentation at 430. Okay. I'm half, I, I haven't been fully following that one, so... So you think okay. the presentation's right at 4.30? Because I'd be interested in I think yeah. Yeah, it was an open house, so I think. Yeah, it was listed yeah. as open house. Yeah. Just stop in and oh, okay. see so what no, we're doing. Okay. But yeah. without a presentation, why have I was kind of confused. Yeah. Might be like a poster and the committee's there to uh, talk to? Or 
So it says, please join the Montpelier Historic Preservation Commission for a community open house. Come learn about the city's design review regulations and provide your comments, meet the commission, et cetera. Yeah, I don't Only think. We have. Yeah, and, and then it's entitled it's just, Design Review Community Open House, but yeah, I think it's so. I think it's designed to be an open. You don't have to be there for the whole period. You can just come in at any time. You can see the map, see the options of what the maps could look like, and I think that's what they're trying to be able to do is to start to have a dialogue. Yeah, where do we want the boundary to be? What do we want our goals to be? So. So how broadly was this invitation distributed? Do you know, I mean, to the citywide? I think it was mailed to every member of, everyone who was in the, des, is it the design review or the historic, I would have to look up what her email was specifically oh, on okay. that one. Yeah, but it wasn't like, it, was ma it wasn't oh. na mailed to everybody in the public, but it was either mailed to everybody in the design review district or it was mailed to everybody that was in the historic district, National Register Historic District. But it was mailed That's to good. one or the other group just to make sure everyone was aware. And then to all of us. And then to all the, yeah. Um, so the other the other piece I wanted to make sure I mentioned was um, this initiative between the high school and the city that's coming up soon called Salons on Boards. Um, called what? Salons is in uh, the the mascot for the high school on oh. boards. Salons. Salons. Yeah. Salons. Yeah, I've always. Oh, I'm from yeah. Tennessee, I've so I'm not handling this. Solon. Solon. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a so Midwestern accent, so yes. <laughs> I can't uh, say the owl. Yeah, yeah. right. The owl. <laughs> <laughs> the owls would be cooler. Um, anyway, uh, I think Leslie's going to have to do a survey to find out what kind of participation we want to do. But uh, she asked me to bring it up, and I looked at the survey. And the two kind of questions that I thought that the group might be interested in, and I'll throw out there right now, is one, how many students would we potentially like to have sitting at the table with us? I'm thinking one to two. We, we used to have seats for students on the Planning Commission, and that went away before I got here. But there, were, there used to be appointed student representatives on the planning commission so this isn't exactly that i think this is more of um more of an observation type thing but the second question i have is how could they be involved so it sounds like it's a little bit up to us um, anyone have opinions or thoughts would they have a specific term or just come to a few meetings or unknown? I would suspect that it's probably semester based or something yeah. like that. Maybe the school year. And is this just to the planning commission or to all it's, different it's city commissions? All the city uh, boards uh -huh. are responding. So, and, and we think that the students asked for this. <laughs> I think based on our survey results, the students may, so like we'll have to put in a description of what we do. Yeah. And so the students would have to, to choose what they would want. And uh, so if we put down that we were willing to take like two students and we gave a description and there was, of course there's going to be many students who are going to be so interested in <laughs> planning Isn't commission that, that they'll have to special. compete in some way. Oh, yeah. I imagine probably like Hunger Games or something. Yeah. Interviews. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so do we have any opinions on <laughs> salons on boards? I think two would be reasonable. Two, yeah. I think more than that would be a little I think it, yeah. too much, for sure. I would be fine if just one of them wanted to show up, if they wanted to alternate or something like that. Okay. Um, because uh, it is a sizable chunk out of their day, out of their evening. Okay. And as far as participation, I mean, they would be full to participate and talk, right? Yeah. They, Public they can't meetings. vote, though. They right? can't vote, no. Right. They're, okay. not, They're not. Unless they were appointed as voting members by the council, they would not have that authority. 
it'd be good to get a younger vehicle. Mm -hmm. One of us wants to just relinquish our vote. <laughs> A delegation. Wait, you of, you I don't think you can story? delegate your <laughs> no. uh, your power. Um, Such as it is. <laughs> <laughs> make them go through the zoning process. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll I'll pass that on to Leslie, and she can fill out the survey then. That's all I have for comments. So moving on to general business. Uh, no one from the public is here, so it seems like we don't have any general business. Um, Mike, did you want to? Should should we should we look at some of the website stuff? Yeah, I mean, for the city plan update, I thought we could just take a few minutes at least, kind of go over some of the things that came up last week. John set up the okay the uh, Google Drive which I guess is just more of a location where we would be able to start to store some of our shared documents as we move forward with this. And we put a document there, right? I put one document there. So we could try it? Just as a placeholder to, to see if you can get there. there. Yeah, yeah okay. if you can get there, that's what it would look like. Um, or at least that's what it looks like on mine. Yeah, in the next um, thing you'll see is I'll, I'll set up basically there'll be a folder uh, for the website for the plan and in that there'll be different folders with the site assets in it so uh, you know any images or documents we want uh, on the website um, and I can walk us through that I guess maybe once it's set up it'll be easier and then show uh, show you the site um, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible so that anybody could edit it if they want um, and that it can, we can continue to use it. And, uh, Do you imagine setting up a different folder for each of the sections of the master plan, I mean, of the written document? Um, that's up to us and how we want to okay. deal with it. Um, we can deal with the plan documents separately, sort of in this, but uh, I'll just keep the website stuff separately and we can link to documents wherever in, in the plan folder that we have. Uh, I don't know if there's a, uh, any preference on folder structure that you've used or how we want to deal with this. I don't know. I'm really looking to, to kind of see where this goes because I don't, I don't have a idea of where what's the right thing or wrong thing so I think either advice from other people or trial and error kind of see what starts to fit together okay what's it called what's it called so this is a uh, Google Drive yeah and but we essentially have a, a folder that's owned by the city that we can use and the everyone on the Planning Commission and Mike have uh, editor access to this so we can put whatever documents we'd like, we can edit any documents, comment on them, um, and we can also make them all uh, publicly visible. So we can give everyone uh, view access but not necessarily let them uh, be able to edit or upload or change anything. Uh, we can also create different folders if we want for any committees and give if we wanted to give the committee chair uh, editor access to just that folder if they wanted to manage anything in there. Um, it's really flexible. Yeah, the Energy Committee has set one up uh, a while ago because we kept getting documents from all over. Mm -hmm. But I just meant, does this particular drive have a name? Oh, it's, I think it's called Planning Commission. Planning Commission. Okay. Planning. Yeah, I think he just called it Planning. Yeah. yeah. Planning. Okay, great. So when I search for it, it gets yeah. a little easier. Right. And it'll show up in your Google Drive as uh, drives like someone shared with me. And you can go and right click and add it to yours. And that, what that'll do is just have it show up like any other folder in your drive. So it might be easier to find um, than something in the like shared with me file. You were able to do that for uh, all of us. So where, where would... 
So where would you on this one, for example, I've shared with me planning, and you said I couldn't right click somewhere. Yep, you should be able to. You can see how much of a. Let's see. You mind if I no, just ahead. drive for a minute? So add to my drive. Oh, okay. And then when you go to your. When I go to my drive, your, it's your drive show up you'll with have all of my so your folders. All of my cats and folders. Okay. Uh, there, folders, planning. So if you go to the email. Perfect. Well, I'm not sure anyway. Oh, there it is. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, yeah. I'm just yeah. And if this works for us, I feel like it'd be a nice kind of re repository for over time having everything in one place that we can find. Yeah, we'll definitely make it a lot easier, especially if we're doing a big document like the master plan or the city plan. We can go through and know we've got somebody wants to look at the open space or whatever the topic is. We've got all the documents here as opposed to having them on what we call the iDrive, which is the server, which people wouldn't have access to because it's where all the other city documents are. All of my documents back up to the iDrive, but having everything on the Google Drive is going to make it easier because we can actually all continue to participate and add stuff to it. Do we know how this interacts with the open meeting laws and like what we should be aware of as far as making sure people... This will be publicly FOIA, FOIA-able, if that's a word. Um, so we'll Does it just need to be accessible, be though? Like doesn't have to be accessible. Um, if people want to view it, I'm sure we would have to provide a certain amount of access to it. But the point is that we want to eventually get to people, that people can have access to view any of these. We just haven't gotten there yet. They yeah, just wouldn't it, be able yeah, to yeah, edit it. Just yeah. adds a level of transparency and that anyone can take a look at what we're working on. Right, we had so many problems with the zoning that people said, oh, I didn't have that particular um, issue of the zoning. And so um, technically, when we make it available to the public, anyone should be able to see our progress. They yeah. won't see how we got there, right? They won't see all the steps before the final edit. There is versioning, so they could, could oh, they be could. able to. Oh, okay. um, I just didn't know. And we could also have it so you can, on the website, for example, on the Montpelier website, if you wanted to link to any documents, you could use like, the URL from the Google Drive if you wanted to use that as sort of the authoritative source for any documents. Oh, yeah. That way we don't have to worry about you know, different versions flying around and uh, people saying they didn't get the latest version of the Zen. Yeah, we could have a certain file within planning that has the most up, this, this is the most up-to-date city plan version is in this file within planning. Yep, although one thing to do to be aware of in Google Drive is all the, um, the files themselves will have unique IDs and unique URLs and they're managed at the file level. So if you move it, you change the name, you move it to another folder, it doesn't matter, it'll still have that same unique ID. So you don't need to like pull things in or out of uh, a particular folder because um, it doesn't really, if you're looking externally, it doesn't, it doesn't really care about that. So, so you're talking about actually pulling uh, that folder and putting it in planning or copying it into planning, right? Rather than giving access to the Google Drive. I think, weren't you talking about allowing people to get access to the People will be able to get access to this. To yeah. this one, the Google Drive here. Yeah, okay, if they would. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, right now, my anything that generally with my computer goes to the iDrive, so we, but that doesn't do the public any good. They would, they can't, they can't see that and be able to edit it, because if they could see it, they could edit it, and that would, you know, we don't want people going in and editing no. <laughs> the old actual archived version so what we want to be able to do is to have a publicly accessible version where people can see it they won't be able to change it but they can see it meanwhile we can go through and make changes 
Are we thinking that we'll link to it from the city's planning commission page, something like that, as far as how the public could get there? Specific pieces, probably not all of it, I would imagine. Like or, if there's something. Or through the site, like the plan site, I imagine that the city's webpage will link to our plan site. The plan site will have give people access to the folders. Kind of for further to all the folders. Yeah. So if they do want to yeah. see all of it, they can see all of it. Yeah, or if there's some that are not great for public facing, uh, we can have one that's more like documents that make sense and another sandbox with stuff that, that would confuse people. Like one that's just being developed and it's in its early phases, I could imagine, would be pretty confusing. Right. Or just someone's notes without any context yeah, or, right, or right, multiple right. versions of something. Sounds great. Did anyone have thoughts on sort of the content of a, a website for the plan? It seems like it could have the first iteration of it focus more on the, the process and there being we could have a community profile section with the maps and then um, maybe a section on the process and he's asking for input and then the actual, once we start drafting it, the functionality of it can be more centered around what uh, the actual plan would look like. So, so you're just thinking more of what would the initial website have, not necessarily what the plan would have, but what the, we what the plan's website would look like. Right, in the meanwhile, we could have, I mean, we could focus on just building a website that's going for the final plan, but it seems like maybe it's opportunity to have one that's a place for people to go for information on where things are at, how they can submit comments. Or yeah, that would be great to have it, just have a way they could submit comments or just to introduce them to what the process is, and so they'll feel like they're more engaged. Is that just a sub page on the city website? Or? Uh, this, I'm thinking of setting it up as it's basically its own, like, this is the cool. um, website for the plan, uh, the city of Montpelier plan. And the URL will awesome. probably be like, we can have it be plan.montpelier slash vt dot, get what the city's URL is. So it'll be, it's in URL, but it'll look, it'll be its own site. Or we could get a different URL if we want, if we just want it to be planmontpelier.org or something. Yeah, well, I would, I would happily help yep. as you're developing that. What's that? I would happily help as you're developing that, figuring Great. out what should go on it and how it should look. Yeah. yeah. I have some experience with that. Awesome. <laughs> I think if, if you have a vision and you want to delegate to us, I think that would be a fine approach, if you know what I mean. Like, if there's, like, you know, a section of, of the process or explanation that, you know, you could assign to, to one of us and you could think about that. Okay. Because it sounds like like you have the vision, so but I don't. But there's no need for all the work to fall on you. So. Yeah, I can set up kind of the skeleton of it, and we can look at it together and uh, see who gravitates towards towards what. Yeah, certainly. If we can find some examples, that was and that was what I was trying to do with my email last week with Plan OKC. For anyone who got a chance to look at that one, which was. Um, just to try to go and find some of these digital plans so we could start to go and look at them and say, I like that, I don't like that. You know, I think this is taking us in a good direction if we went in that, you know, well, whatever. So that was just one that I happened to stumble across in some of my reading, and so I thought that was um, a good one. And I've got my mouse working here. I mean, we can look at what they had kind of set up with theirs, but. I'd have to, I can turn the light out if we wanted to go through and look at, I don't know, if, did anyone get a chance to take a look at I, I looked through it that a little one. bit. Yeah. Yeah. We can't dim the lights. No, we can't dim the lights. They would either be on or off, but I can turn them off if we wanted to just take a look at <laughs> real briefly what they did. Switch these. So some of this still, I mean, we have to decide what we're going to call it, what sort of timeline we've got. We have a lot of decisions to make before we can really have 
too much of a website. I mean, okay. is the website some place where we would also potentially link to other things, like if anybody found a recording of Ed McMahon's presentation? I mean, would we put uh, links to other public presentations in it as well? Yeah, I think it would be great to have a resources section and have, you know, a lot of the other documents that we're, we'd be building on. You think of like the economic development plan, the yeah. net, the net zero stuff. Um, yeah, I imagine only one place that make it easier to find, right? For sure. Yeah, I'd I'd come in. There, there was a couple of pieces. I mean, we'd have to at some point on the web in a document have an introduction. Have we talked about the chapters that would be short and the implementation plans that would have to go along with them? So when I was looking at the, you know, they've got browse topics and browse by elements. So really, the browse by elements was kind of how I had been thinking about things. So for them, the sustain OKC is the land use plan, connect is the transportation plan, green is the environmental plan or the natural resources plan. Live, I would kind of think, is, is housing enrich preservation appearance and culture we don't have to use what they used uh, strengthen is their economic development plan serve is their uh, so they they did it in two parts so they had by topic so if you wanted to know about education education kind of links to there may be some parts of education that are in sustain some that are in connect some that are in live so you can see how by topic there's you can find something, how are we going to implement by topic? Um, or if you went down here, you could go down to sustain, and that would give you the plan for, you know, the more of the written plan for how we're going to accomplish the land use plan. And that's kind of a short one that goes into the introduction, the goals and the initiatives. So this was a little bit more of you know, maybe this the second one was a little bit more of how I thought it would eventually get to that we would be organizing by groups. In this case, this is the land use plan. Um, there would be a short. This is actually there's there is a written piece. If you click somewhere near the downloadable P PDF, you'd end up with the written plan, which was about six pages long. So it's not all that different than kind of what we had been thinking about. They have goals and initiatives. I didn't like necessarily how they did their goals or initiatives. I thought they were still less specific than what we had been talking about. We were really kind of talking about being strategic, being um, very direct in what we wanted to see done, as opposed to they were taking more of the general approach. Uh, and then as you adopt an ordinance, you would review the ordinance to the plan to go and see if it encourages more vitality in the downtown, you know, as opposed to saying, you know, as opposed to being more vague in general, which is what they did, um, their goals. So we're a little bit more general than... Is there is there anyone in your office who's who's an employee who would be working on this? This is going to be mostly my responsibility from a from a from a high level. As it gets down to more of the specifics, um, like housing, we have a community development specialist Kevin Casey. He would probably be working with the housing committee to work with them. What I'm thinking is, once the substance is developed, I'm looking at this, and it's really it's 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 really a web design strategy, really, like where they conceptualize it two or three different ways here, but it really links all to the same content. Yeah. So you can, I mean, once you have the substance of content, which is what we'll be doing and what Mike will be doing, it's easy to do this, but it also takes some like know-how. To, yeah. A lot of time. To, yeah. yeah. And my thought with this was simply to start going and looking and let's, if we can find some other plans, web-based plans or digital plans that we think we like or we think, this was the only one I could find. I spent a lot of time 
trying to Google keywords to try to come up with more of more plans that were really web based. The, this plan you can download and print and it's 500 pages long, which is what we've been trying to avoid is having a 500 page plan. But, and I think that's what they wanted to avoid was the 500 page plan. They want it online, they want it where you can you know, as they had here, you, you can kind of get in and understand what the goals are. Put my glasses back on so I can, and then you can hit the pluses and you can see click to expand related initiatives and you'd be able to really start to, to work into the details if you were interested in the details. If you're interested in a specific statistic, we can pop up the, spe the specific you know, this was how they, it really is designed, their plan is designed to be online. It's designed to be digital. And yes, it can be printed out into a 500 page document, but they really want the community to interact with this plan digitally. And I think that's what we've been thinking about is, is we do have to have a printed document. We will have a printed document, but ultimately we'd like to have a web presence because this ability to connect elements that are in the housing plan that relate to the energy plan, yeah. it would be nice to be able to put them in a single document where they can't be different because the there's a single plan for energy efficiency or, or, or policy or a program on weatherization that can be linked to from the housing because it makes housing more affordable and linked to energy because this same program also works to accomplish our energy goals but it's a single program that is helping two different elements. And that's where I think the... That's sort of what we wanted to start with, with our meeting, is bringing people together to And see seeing where, where we overlap and, yeah. and where we have items that miss. And, you know, so they, they did it a little different, but I think they had a lot of pieces here that kind of started to get us, or at least to get me thinking about what I liked and what I thought could be improved on and and you know they did this as part of their introduction why and how why plan i think these are all important pieces but again this this is stuff you could print out into a document into the introduction section but for these guys they did it this way um i also did a little bit of looking around the city of dover new hampshire actually had these but did them as videos so rather than read the plan, you actually could click on this and actually watch a YouTube video of why this housing initiative is important. And it's got the, the city planner or the, the housing people, and they go through different things. It's, it's another idea that could be built on. Again, we don't have to bite off everything all at once, um, but it, it, there were some neat ideas that if you start looking around for digital plans on the web, you can start grabbing some ideas that says, we aren't there yet, but if we had the plan, we had it done, we actually could do videos that would help to tell the story to people who may not be interested in sitting down and working through these or reading these. They actually could click on what's the housing plan and you could watch a, a five minute video of what the housing plan is and why it's important and what we're looking at doing to accomplish it. So, but that's... John, do you know of any templates of any kind of, uh, of digital plans? must have looked at a million plans over time. Uh, probably not millions. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, I'm not aware of any kind of out of the box uh, plans that would meet, that would be a good fit for Vermont. Um, Vermont's a little unique in that we have all these tiny municipalities, um, whereas most of the country works at a regional level and therefore can put a lot of uh, resources into it, but, but they also end up being fairly unwieldy and, and not, not particularly useful. And um, for me, I, I appreciate or I see an opportunity in being able to create a, uh, a tool for us to, to use as like a roadmap to where we want to go and track progress and have it be like a living plan that we don't we don't do it and then we're like oh we did the plan now let's let's, let's do work that's unrelated to the plan we just did because thank god we just finished the plan like it should be 
<laughs> let's, let's design something that will be useful for us and, and not worry too, too much about, um, it's, it can be easy to be like mystified by some functionality that a lot of these sites provide, but when you like look at their site metrics or they're not, they're not actually useful, they're just really cool looking. And I want to, like, yes, our plan's going to look great, but it looking cool should be secondary to being useful. And uh, that if we keep our, our, our focus, I think, on usability and what matters and how, uh, if we think of ourselves like two years down the line, are we able, is what we're making, creating right now going to be useful to us? It's a good question to, to ask. Yeah. Maybe we should write down those values at some point to go and say, this is really what we're shooting for, is we want a website that does this, does this, and does this, and or... We can track over time to see what our progress is. Yeah, then we can start to build, make sure we're building towards that and not grabbing the next it seems, bang idea. It seems like if we, if we figure out the content and the substance the way that we want it, like John's explaining, that, that you really can take that content and then rearrange it in ways to give the functionality that we want. Like, it, I think it's, I mean, for, I'm not a web expert, but it seems like it can come second. Um, and so we can, it's something that we can, you know, deal with once we have our content. I think that's fair. The other piece is, is thinking about those, the right metrics that would tell us whether or not we're meeting you know, we're getting to where we want to go and making sure that those exist. So for, you know, American Community Survey, there's so many data sources out there that we can set it up to be automated so as new things come out, they'll just update. A lot of the problems plans have in Vermont is people set up metrics that they can't measure, um, and therefore it's a nice list of things that would be cool for us to be able to measure, but we can't do it, it's not, it's not going to help us. Um, and that's challenging oftentimes because of, again, it's a question of scale and, and availability. Uh, but, but thinking of those and thinking of a few, uh, a few good ones, I think what, like one of my favorite plans is the, um, was started in New York City, the Vision Zero plan, right? Like their plan for, um, for bike infrastructure and, and transportation infrastructure basically had like one goal was zero deaths. Like that was like a very easy to understand, like powerful, we go there, that's it. It's literally the name of the plan and uh, something they measure. So it could be just one thing. If you pick the right thing, um, it can just be very effective. Sorry, what, what are they measuring? Zero? Uh, d deaths, traffic deaths. Oh, or... deaths, okay. It's <laughs> for like cyclists or for like all transportation? I think it was for, for all transportation, but it's focused on, I think, uh, pedestrian and bicycles. And then the picking, picking what thing we measure is always very important because it's not always Which one you pick ends up being very important because if you're chasing the wrong, sometimes in order to fix, uh, I remember working in Barry City, lots of issues, um, what was going to be the thing that we were going to target on um, to fix the storefront vacancies and the poverty and a number of the other metrics that were issues. And the one that we focused on as our primary one was to put 500 jobs in five years. Well, 500 jobs isn't filling any storefront vacancies. And it's not doing, an, it's not, it, but if your focus on, you know, the, the, the metric that we actually worked on was getting jobs in the downtown. And our goal was 500 jobs in five years. And the reason for that was because if we could get more feet on the sidewalks during the day, that would help the storefront to, you know, now we're putting customers there. And now it's up to the, to the economic development side to try to fill the storefronts now that we've put customers there. So that was kind of our metric was get, get feet on the ground 
Um, rather than trying to say, our goal is to fill the storefronts, which kind of was our goal, but we were going to do that. that operationally, we were going to do that by getting more jobs in the downtown. So we actually were only counting jobs in the downtown and made the assumption that if we did this, these other secondary benefits were going to be reduced poverty, uh, re uh, reduced storefront vacancies, and it actually worked, as opposed to if you directly were trying to fill storefront vacancies, you may have not, you know, it, it, so it, you may not have gotten what you had hoped for because you were trying to. But ultimately, your goal was, if your measurable metric was how many new jobs there were. How many new downtown. jobs there were in the downtown. Okay. Not necessarily increasing the overall population of customers. That was not part that of it. That was not part okay. of it. We just recognized that what we needed, what, what we were missing, um, was the fact that we didn't have um, this, the parts of the downtown that had jobs had full storefronts. The parts of town that had vacant storefronts also lacked jobs during the day. So they had, uh, they didn't have the second floors that had jobs. Uh, they had a lot of vacant building lots. Um, so what we did in that particular case was to purchase the old Rite Aid building, which was a vacant, blighted building, tear it down, and then sponsor to have a, what ended up being City Place there. We also had the other end of that same stretch of buildings was the Cornerstone building that was privately purchased um, and fixed up which also added more jobs on that part of town. So the, the point was, if we got the jobs, that these other issues that were in, in existence in that area would also then be fixed, as opposed to saying, we want to reduce this, we want to reduce this, we want to fix this. What we're actually going to do is, is focus on one thing, which was the jobs, get them in the correct places. And there's a little bit of hope that that would fix the problem, and it, but it did. A lot of that side of that particular street got fixed um, in that in that case. So sometimes, as we talk about these things, we'll have to be focusing on what we would talk about proximate and ultimate goals. Um, if we get fixing, you know, w what should we be working on to fix a certain issue? But but I guess I could probably turn the lights on here with um, unless there are more pieces of the website. But it was an idea. Um, if, if you guys find other websites that have plans, you know, share them, let us know. We can look through them and see. But I, I had a tough time finding them that actually kind of met what we were trying to do. Uh, the other thing is photos. If anyone has photos, they can, or knows of a photo, a source of photos to include. Those always sort of bring things to life sometimes be an afterthought or hard to find. I imagine Montpelier Live probably has a good amount of photos we could probably use. Yeah, I think the city contracted, when we set up our new website, the city contracted with somebody to take pictures. So I think that we actually have a set of photos. And they were paid to take pictures year round. So that way we'd be able to have, you know, when it scrolls by with the different you know, pictures of the capital. It, it'll have spring pictures and summer pictures and winter pictures. So, is that all done, or that's still? In? I think it's. I think it's. I don't know if it's done yet, but I don't know where those pictures are. I would have to ask Seth, probably where the archive of those photos is. That would be good. To so, just a question on. I mean, this just seems like a big chunk of work and so what would the timeline I mean I echo what Kirby said about farming out bits because I don't have any technical expertise with websites but I mean what would be our ideal timeline for putting this together I'm just wondering like oh. realistically or Real <laughs> <laughs> realistically I've I've said to do the city plan and to do to do this new idea and to do it right it's going to probably take at least two to three years probably two years it'll take it it took us a year and a half just to get through the public hearing process for zoning i wouldn't expect it to be any faster um, even if we got it done in a year and a half 
Um, and, and I would like to, as much as I'm always wanting to do more and do everything, if we had our meetings with the various committees, and we developed a plan that just grabbed the top three, top five things that everybody wanted to do and really built a plan around that, knowing that we could, we could have, I mean, this is probably a half million dollar plan. Um, if, if we were able to just capture those big things and get that down into a format, into a plan with some targeted strategies, just to, just to fill the plan for all the different committees, and we could start moving forward. And then over the next eight years, we could continue to, you know, kind of mine down in and, and flesh out some of those plans that need more details. You know, if we've got the details in the energy plan, we can build them in. But those connections between the you know, energy plan and other plans, other parts, those could be built over time. Those will, yeah, and those, those, some of those may be built over time. We may not have 100% of, I think when the housing group did theirs, they had five aspirations and they may have had 25, 30 different strategies, different tasks to work on. Some of them they would work on, some of them they're not. Some of them are just linking to the energy plan or linking to the transportation plan. But um, to do that much detail for all the plan chapters and all the committees would take years. But if we just focus on really getting the skeleton and getting it built in and start to, and then we can start to implement the plan rather than taking four years to build the plan and we aren't implementing, let's get the big pieces done. So I guess that maybe I misunderstood. I guess I thought the website was going to be for the work in progress too, or have I? Yeah, that yeah. the okay. website will be easy. Oh, okay. We'll so we'll, we'll have so it we'll, up in the month. Oh, okay. So we'll just have a very basic website, and then I guess this. What looking at this website? This this <laughs> website like, here is their final product. Off. These the the. So it'll eventually look like this. It'll or, evolve over time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Like a mini version of this. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. This uh, plan OKC. Okay, this was the the APA American Planning Association Plan of the Year. This plan they had. Let's see. The they hadn't updated their plan since 1977. And this is the end product of some years of work that I think may have started I'm trying to see if they had the timeline in here. They didn't. Um, I'm going to guess this started probably three or four years ago. And so this is what, when they finished their planning, they developed the website to kind of um, have have the planning quote document is a, is an online digital document as opposed to you know going up top and downloading what is a you know 254 megabyte plan um, not including the supporting studies and plans so for them it was you know, rather than having everybody go and say, here's our official city plan, let's put this on the shelf, it's 550 pages long, their plan was to come out with this online version so people could go through and say, okay, how are we going to do transportation? How are we going to do energy? How can I look at this? How can I search this? Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Um, I think that helps everyone kind of conceptualize where we're going. And for me, it was a reminder of once we get the content, you can map it out in all these cool ways, and yeah, it's something we can we can shoot for. But and I, I think one thing I would add though to to Ariane's comment is um, some of it's up to us how quickly we can get through. I mean, we could we could decide to put more time into it in the short term and and move faster. Um, Totally something we can do. We could do like a planathon and just bang it out in a weekend. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> have just have a chat. This would be kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, if One you full weekend of that might, planning we're like, we're great. The best we can do in two days, we're going to adopt it. <laughs> <laughs>
never mind that public comment. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, oh, then the public can come in and attack the, the whole weekend's yeah. worth of work. And no one has time to argue. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right, that's right. So you have to keep it very limited. Yeah. Well, with, with that, we can move on to the punch list and try to get a chunk of it out. Uh, I'm sure Leslie will be happy if we can do that. These are absolutely I never would want to miss the first list. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it all out because I was part of the process that was developed. Oh, yes. A lot to look at. Yeah. So the second column are your comments. Yeah. Or, or also, there it is. I kind of did it. It's kind of a mix. I didn't do as clean a job as I did last time keeping the actual recommendations. Some of them kind of mixed together. Okay. So. Yes. Do you remember what number we were on? We finished part one, so we're on part two. Okay. The floor is yours, Mike. Um, I don't have an extra copy, do you? Sorry. Uh, I was actually going to un I had unplugged my computer, and then I came upstairs. I was like, I should have printed out some more uh, copies. No, I think I printed this out already. Yeah, sorry. Thank um, you. Just look up. So some of these should be pretty quick. Um... So the uh, 13 is just saying, it just goes to the fact that it says that in design review, the DRB shall approve them, except that now, according to the new rules, the DRB doesn't approve all of them. DRB only approves some of them, so we just needed to amend how this was written to read under the processes established in 4301 and the following rules. So that's really kind of a technical fix. Um, a couple of these strike frontage build out, um, we had eliminated, or the city council had eliminated the maximum front setback. So when Brandy was here, she had presented that in certain districts there was a minimum setback and a maximum setback, and you had to have a certain amount of the frontage of your building appearing between that minimum and maximum setback. The issue started coming up is that all makes great wonderful sense until you start having a building that already has its maximum front set back but then also wants to put a building in the back maybe there's a carriage house that they want to renovate well the carriage house doesn't meet that or the big one that we have was the hotel we already have a hotel at the front and they want to build a hotel in the back but according to the rules you can't build unless you've got in that frontage so they would have to connect that new hotel to the old hotel in order to legally be allowed to build that hotel so the city council eliminated the front setback because it functionally wouldn't work in a number of cases um is so there, is there any kind of negative policy outcome that could come of this no we didn't have it in the in the previous version um it's it would we would have to go through and write some other details and we have a number of other buildings that are similar to this um, on elm street we've got some buildings that are on the front it would be on the other side of the street where you up from from you but down towards town more where there's a, a primary building in front and a primary building in back and that primary building in back doesn't meet the front the maximum setback requirement you know but maybe the primary the original building does so is it possible for us to write something that on a part? We'd have to revise some rules and have much more detailed sets of rules. And what we were trying to do with the fix was to go through and just clean, it up. clean, clean up where we have issues. And so what we have now is um, a frontage build-out requirement, but we don't have a maximum setback, so you actually can't calculate that. So that's why 14 can't be done. Um, and you'll notice 16, 17 also are the um, same thing. Another one that came up um, from the city council is, which is number 15. Um, we had some conversations about this among us, about the fact that uh, were we going to regulate riparian buffers in the downtown? And the planning commission said no. Some members of the public convinced the city council um, 
a lot of our downtowns are already built up to the edge. We've got a lot of these things going on. It wasn't a place where we could really make this work, but the city council was convinced enough that in areas that had not been channelized, we should still enforce the riparian setback. So the question then came up is what's channelized um, and it's not defined. So we may either need to come up with a map. The, the city council had pointed out, well, look at the parking lot behind Positive Pi, um, Abishans, that stretch there. That's a perfect example of where we would want to have vegetated buffers. Um, it's not channelized. The very first zoning application that comes up is the Moat parking lot that the city owned and the DRB looked at it and said, well, this area is already channelized, so it doesn't need to meet the buffer setback. It's just because there's no definition of what a channelized area is. So um, we should either produce a map or we need to come up with a written definition of what channelized is. And I recognize we weren't the ones that came up with it, but we need to come up with something to the, the city council. I think it's the last ditch effort to prevent riparian buffers everywhere that we did actually come up with that language. I, I think we did come up with the channelized language, didn't we? No, we actually exempted Urban Center One, Two, and what became Urban Center Three. But when, but when the city council. Oh, yep. Changed it to riparian buffers. We wrote up some language real quick to kind of counter that. Yeah, and I don't think it was sufficient. I thought they did. I thought we won that one. And so we did. It was actually reviewed by the council. Yeah. The new language. Yeah. So right now the setback is zero from the river in downtown. Where All downtown. Touched. Well, this is saying, except, weren't you saying it's all of the area and not because we haven't defined what channelized is? Uh, so right yes, now, but in, in urban center dimension one is. I think three zero zero five. Section 3005 is riparian, I believe. Yes, so. I think point D1, except in urban one, two, and three, applicants may receive a waiver. With, within the unchannelized portions of Urban Center 1, Urban Center 2, and Urban Center 3, and within the entire riverfront district, the riparian buffer shall be 15 feet. Within the channelized portion of Urban Center 1, Urban Center 2, Urban Center 3, there shall not be a, buffered, a buffer requirement. Okay. So, it, yeah, that kind of overrides what was in... Yeah, and you the think definition of like we channelized. of channelized? You think that we'll be able to map out what's channelized, as opposed to the DRB, just in a case by case situation, looking at whether. I mean, it feels it feels like it's more precise for the DRB to to look each time. And that's that's fine. We're we are pointing out. This was pointed out by us as from an administrative standpoint that. Uh -huh. It's that we, we have a clear gray area that certainly the city council thought it's going to be obvious the areas that are not channelized because areas just like Jacob's lot isn't channelized. And yet that's the first application that comes up and the first case that they say that is channelized. Well, if Jacob's lot is channelized, what would be unchannelized? Right, then all of it. <laughs> then to some degree, all then of to some degree, is. all of it is going to be. But there's a difference between a slope and a completely vertical wall. Right? Yeah. And so we, I would think the intent would be if it's a completely vertical wall, we're going to call that channelized. If it's a if it's a rock face that's sloped, right? Yeah. It's still channelized, but not not like between two vertical walls. And there's, <laughs> and there's right? vegetation. Yeah, and I think that's right? the, the, that was the legislative intent, I believe, as well, which was okay. that they were looking at, well, we've got the areas that are north of the Rialto Bridge on State Street. And you can look up there, and you can see there's stacked stone. It's, uh, it's clearly channelized. The river's not going to be moving. The riparian is, you know, the buildings go right up to the edge. We can't really be asking people to have a setback in those areas. Um, 
So could we write a definition? We could certainly be more specific. I just we just wanted to point out the fact that as it's currently being applied, it, it's almost being applied how we had written it as the planning commission because it's the city council that kind of tried to go through and split things out when they said well some of some of the urban center one will have buffers and setbacks and some of them won't ultimately we're kind of back to where we said which was this is going to be too complex to and is there a caveat for pre-existing too? Like if there's already something neighboring you that goes that far, are you allowed? We were trying to figure out how to do the pre-existing, but it was starting to get a little bit of what was pre-existing and how long was it pre-existing and what happens in this in a pre-existing case if something burns down or somebody tears something down. Because we have proposals where people were looking at a building that was within that right on the river wall and they were proposing to come in we're going to tear down this building and we're going to build a new building and if it starts to be pre-existing non-conforming then you tear it down and you now have to meet those buffers and setbacks so we were like well now we'll exempt those and you can build back because there you're not non-conforming because there's a zero lot line setback and so what was the development for the jacobs lot like what what was the permit for? To build the um, the parking lot. So they were going to be tearing down the TKS. So it actually wasn't the Jacobs parking lot. It's actually downstream towards the railroad bridge. So we purchased as the city the m and Beverage Building and the Association for the Blind. And we're tearing down those two buildings. And there's going to be a new parking lot in back. And the front lot was going to be developed. Mm -hmm. um, Is this touching the North Branch on the Winners Key? It touches the north branch, but not, not the Winooski, because it right at the stops at the rail bridge. Oh, rail bridge right. behind okay. Shaw. So is it just going to be a parking lot, or is there? It's still going to be developed, even though the parking lot's still going to be developed because we still have to build the road, we still have to build the bike path. Um, but the initial proposal that was going to be a private development didn't end up going through. So we're going to still own all the parcels as as things sit today. But we're, we still have to build that back parking lot. It's going to still be developed with that rear parking lot. We'll just have a, a developable site up front that maybe that'll be a parking lot temporarily. I don't know. At this point, it's just a building lot. So the question was how far towards the river could that parking lot go? How far could it go, and does it did that have to meet the riparian? And it would, okay. And it was going to end up having some... Buffer? Buffer. Yes, I, I would imagine they're not going to pave all the way to the water. But in the cases where there were things that they that they needed in that area, they got permission because they could, because it was not considered buffer, it was just, they just met the landscaping requirement for landscaping and not the 3005 riparian naturally wooded vegetation requirement. And is there is there any stormwater management? Yeah, that, I mean that's going to have that's that was a requirement because it's so part of a bigger project. Yeah. So I don't, know. It's, I don't think we've received any testimony that suggests that we're improving water quality with the buffer in that location. It's really a stormwater management problem. Mm -hmm. And the so, only way you can really build all the way up to the river is if it is a vertical wall. You can't otherwise you can't. Right. But it's a it's a matter of degree. But potentially, could they have built a wall if they if oh, they if it's if they've got the ruling that there's no that it's it's not a riparian buffer? Could they have built a wall? Yeah, I think. Well, I mean, depending on whether they meet the flood hazard, floodway requirements, they could they could have. But I think where this ended up being an issue was instead of meeting the 15 foot naturally vegetated back. You know, uh -huh. they could be, they may have encroached up to maybe 10 feet which they still left some natural vegetation in there that they weren't going to remove, but some of it was also planted and not, you know, kind of the wild not natural. Not the natural vegetation. Yeah, not the natural vegetation. It's kind of more landscaped. But like bringing in fill would be a whole nother mess if they're trying to actually build up that wall, right? Yeah. In the floodway. 
yeah, in the floodway, that would would not have been possible. But if it was out of the floodway, then they would be able to be as close as the flood hazard area would allow. So your recommendation? Uh, the, the recommendation on this one really was, in this case, I didn't have a specific one um, other than to think if we're going to do it, I think the cleanest thing would be to develop a map. And I didn't actually develop one, but if you think that's the direction to go, before I started to expend time and resources, I thought, and there's a couple of these that are in here if you read through them. There are a couple of them I didn't really give a recommendation before I jump in and rewrite like chunks. To go back to our language that we originally <laughs> proposed and explain to the city council that what they passed is not working it's very a, well. It's an open... It's an open process. Any Anything in the zoning can be proposed for changing. We can certainly propose to change it back if that's the will of the Planning Commission otherwise. Would, would there be a problem with uh, developing a map? I'd like to see a map. That would be helpful. Yeah, I think it would be helpful for applicants to see. Yeah, if I had a map, I mean, I'm looking, I'm trying to keep my my administration glasses on and thinking if, if we want to implement this, if we want to meet the will of the council, what would be the cleanest for me would be to have a map that would go and say this this bank is this bank isn't if people want to dispute the map we've got a map people can go and say i think the jacobs lot is in fact channelized then we can have people a vote when you draw properties on their lines <laughs> draw lines on their property that's different than their neighbors yeah although these are mostly not Residential, at least. Chips. Yeah, and the question so comes up: just means we deal with lawyers. Or or <laughs> yeah, and what do we do if there's missing? You know, if it's going down one side and the wall had collapsed years ago, and it's kind of this bank that's going in and it's channelized here and it's channelized here. Is it channelized there, even though it's not technically a wall? That's right. They, so we there's have a, a little wall. bit there's of channelized wall. there, but that's yeah. definitely not. channelized. Yeah, half that's channelized that's wall. <laughs> Well, I, I will try to put I together think, a map. I think the outcome from the DRB decision is right. I don't see any harm caused by that decision. So if we do map it, I would be inclined to follow the, their precedent, if, if you want to call it that, and be liberal in what we define as, a, as channelized, at the very least. And another way to put it was map our original intent. But I thought our original intent was that if it was already vegetated, if it had vegetation on it, then it should have the riparian buffer. The original intent was to not have riparian buffers and to let the stormwater handle it. So we had, mm -hmm. out of the planning commission was Urban Center 1, Urban, well, Urban Center, what, what eventually ended up being Urban Center 1, Urban Center 2, and Urban Center 3 were exempt from the riparian standards. Because, because they they're already developed in the downtown, and what we would end up managing was really the stormwater through a different set of provisions. Um, but what we wanted to, because currently under, well, I say currently, under the zoning that was in effect before 2017, we had no water setback requirements. We had no riparian buffers anywhere in the city. So when we went to put in these new rules, there was a lot of questions of whether they were going to work and how they're going to work. And, how this, and so eventually the planning commission came to, at least the way I always envisioned it was, we will enforce this everywhere outside of the urban center. We may in the future extend this into the urban center, but the fact that it doesn't exist at all today, and we will now be protecting 90% of our stream banks with this riparian buffer. The only things we won't be doing are these urban sections, which will probably be addressed through stormwater. The city council came in and said we should also enforce some places in the urban, in the downtown. And it was kind of left these gray areas that we don't know what's channelized and what's not channelized. So I'll put together a map and we'll... So the city council was influenced by some testimony from the public that kind of conflicted with the expert testimony that the planning commission heard. And most of us, I think, were of the mind that the, re the, the repairing buffer change that the city council made wasn't going to protect stormwater anymore, but it was going to possibly get in the way of development in the place most appropriate for development, which is our already urbanized downtown. 
and so so that was that's been our concern with it all along um, and I think putting our energy towards uh, non-regulatory means of restoring addressing stormwater managing it and restoring the river corridor where we can as opposed to uh, a lot of effort into trying to find some sophisticated way of, of protecting or, or regulating an area that's not going to provide us very much benefit in terms of water quality resources better spent yeah, that's completely fair. I mean, like adding a 15-foot buffer into a parking lot that's already right on the river isn't going to do anything. I don't want to see further channelizing of the river. That's that's where the perspective I'm coming from. <laughs> I don't want to see them add that wall if it's not already there. Yeah, took took the river down for it right. because it's already really bad. <laughs> so, so the only discussion then is re referencing whether or not it would help water stormwater penetration into the ground rather than any issues of setback, the riparian setback providing a softer edge to the to the uh, river. Do we we never discussed that at all then, right? So uh, infiltration? No, not not just relating it to water infiltration, but relating it to as you stand on the Rialto Bridge. Well, that's not a good example. But if you're standing on the new bike path and looking down that it's no, it's, it has a softer edge. And that's sort of my impression in some cases from what people of the, some of the members of the public said, that they, you know, they didn't want to see development going right up to the edge. And that they may not even have addressed the, the stormwater infiltration at all. Yeah, possibly. I mean, we, and we could do all of the stormwater management that we want in Montpelier, but the flooding that we have is not going to change much because of that, which is part of this challenge, too. Like, even if, because we are so close to the river and because it is channelized, even if we start saying, well, let's keep a little bit of water on site, well, that's only going to do so much. It's a really yeah, it's still, a, I mean, it's a flood wave. It's really determining that. Okay, so I will put together a map and, and I'll put that on my list and then we can debate whether we think the map is right or wrong. I mean, it really is a yes or no. Is this channelized? Is this not channelized? And the public can get their opportunity to weigh in, weigh in on what parts should or shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, so number 18 is, uh, actually we, we had two cases that have come out, surprisingly, um, on art studios which does not appear anywhere in the zoning. Um, and it's actually trickier than you would think because you have to decide what's art. And, you know, painting landscapes will have no impact on your neighbors. Having a kiln or making sculptures out of trash or welding or something else can actually be quite, you know, if you're going to, you know, I had even here stone carving. You know, your art studio could be making granite statues and you're using pneumatic drills and hammers. That's going to be clearly, we, it, it, you know, to go and send somebody who's doing landscapes to do a conditional use hearing it kind of seems overkill. So we're, we're trying to come up with and find out how other communities have handled these. Um, Isn't it, do we have any, uh, we have a sound ordinance, right? We do have a sound ordinance, and we could always use that as the kind of the the backup. But certainly, from a zoning standpoint, they would. The, some of the things that are sort of described too is the difference between an art, a gallery and a studio, where actual a workshop. It really sounds like all of those discussions are more in terms of what people are working on, and that to me seems like it's a light industrial kind of. And that's actually what we ended up classifying it because we didn't have a definition for art studio. Um, we had to find something that it would meet the definition of. And actually, it, it's light manufacturing because you're actually producing something. But it seemed strange because it was somebody who was actually looking to do painting. Were they selling? Were they... Were they 
Nope, no, no gallery, no gallery. They just they were renting. This wasn't a home. Office. It couldn't fit under home occupation. Nope, they had they were taking an uh, an office, a vacant office, um, in the downtown, and they were going to use it to just use as their art studio. And they were going to they had a, a number of them that were going to come in, and they were just going to be able to have a place where they could have their paints and their art, and they would have a working space for artists who want to go and work on this. And we thought that's great, but, but restricted we don't to have. Painting. Yeah, in this yeah. case, I think it was restricted just to painting, but a studio, when you start saying art studio, you start getting into what's art. And I think one of my examples in here was music. I mean, somebody could go through and say, I've got a rock band. This is my art studio. <laughs> you know, it's We can certainly regulate it through a noise ordinance, but I think... So if that's our if that's our approach we want to take, we would just make an art studio something as a permitted use and let the impacts of that be regulated through the noise ordinance. I, I, I would be okay with it. But you, you not? I don't feel comfortable with that. I would be really <laughs> upset to have somebody suddenly next door with um, heavy equipment. Um, it's certainly, I mean, it is producing something. Uh, but I guess you're right that the art studio, I mean, the painting studio could also be producing something. Um, I, I just, yeah. I mean, for one thing, that the potential um, threat from different kinds of processes is going to be more significant. So it seems, it still seems to me like it's a light industrial use. And, you know, if people, if somebody came in with a painting studio, and they wanted to argue that um, they could ask for an exemption. But is there a problem with putting it in as light industrial? Nope. We just needed to find out. You know, we were doing a zoning fix, and so here we had an issue where two two times we've had applications, and both times we've interpreted them both as light manufacturing, which meant they were going to have a heavier burden, a higher burden for permits because they were going to have to go through and get conditional use permits in the district that they were located. So the question comes up. But they were able to do that? They, they're in the process of applying. And, you know, one of the questions that comes up is, you know, did they want to wait for a zoning fix if it was going to get easier down the road? Um, I, I don't. I'm dealing with this side of things. Meredith and Audra deal with the actual permits and whether they're they're in, but it was worth it was a worthy question that comes up when okay we don't have art studio, do we want to make an, a specific use for it or do we want to roll it into the definition of light manufacturing which is fine that's what we're doing right now. I think I say we just make it permitted. Permitted under what? A permitted use. Just make it its own use with a definition, and then in the downtown area, like yeah. permitted use for for that area. Yeah, of course, yeah. in the downtown. Uh, Which anywhere. Probably by the time it reaches neighborhoods, those we would want to have associated with the occupant. So you wouldn't have. In this case, we're talking about things. It's not where people live. This is an art studio where. People don't live there, and I think by the time you get to a residential 3,000 neighborhood, somebody who's doing art's probably doing it in association with their house. We wouldn't want them to have a separate art studio in a residential neighborhood. Or we would. I don't know. What's that? <laughs> or maybe we would. I don't know. Um, I think if it, it could fit under the home occupation. I think that they, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. That's what I was thinking with the residential neighborhoods. It's the non-residential neighborhoods, because I think if it's in the residential neighborhood, it should be associated with their residents. Yes, they're present there. And we have rules that would allow an art studio in those but home occupations, occupations and businesses, yeah. yeah. But the question is, if it's really in a downtown, downtown. location, that's not. If we were to
So it, it basically, you have looked at it as light manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, uh, Which was giving them a higher. So it's a conditional use in the downtown. That note is? Not occupying more than 20,000 square feet. Okay. So it's a size limit. Yeah. So if you're considering light manufacturing units under that, they already would be able to? They would be able to in urban one, two, or three, but they would need to have a conditional use hearing. Which isn't impossible. Again, if you're doing landscape painting, that's not an issue. It just means we're sending you through a public hearing process. Just the mere fact that we're have allowing for light manufacturing or light industrial here suggests that we should probably allow our studios. Within the same classification, which... No, I don't think the bar should be... I don't think there's as much risk for our studio for... Uh, I don't see a whole lot needing from an art studio needing to go through this. Well, if there's welding or high high temperature kilns being used, I don't know. think there's anything in the conditional use review that's going to change what kiln. Well, at least there's, uh, there are other eyes looking at it in terms of um, requirements. But what I don't think these eyes have anything that will help us make Montpelier a better place or help anyone's safety, right? Like, I don't well, think the DRB is going to have a, a whole lot to offer with regards to, like, kiln so placement. And then give us a synopsis of what the DRB would be looking at. Then. Well, I mean, they're going to look at character of the area, the impact on community facilities and traffic are the three, the three big ones. Yeah. But impact on community facilities and services is where the fire chief has his public, his ability to make comments. Right. I mean, it's doubtful any of these will have traffic impacts. Um, they have you know, to get building permits. They're yeah. subject to the building. Yeah. The so in terms of that, I think um, additional, I mean, it's not an onerous requirement for them to go to a conditional use as other light manufacturing is. It's, it seems like if the use is at the level that you're like worried about, that it might actually have crossed the line into manufacturing. If it's like a lot of welding, a lot of machinery. Do we have a definition for light yeah, manufacturing? Yeah, I think the definition is what the cell is coming down to. We do have a definition for light manufacturing. Separate. There's light manufacturing. Yeah, manufacturing light, creation of goods entirely within an enclosed structure that do not rely on special power, water, wastewater disposal for their operations. For example, bakeries and small wood shops. So we considered creation of art in these cases to be light manufacturing. Right. Or that definition, that sounds like it would be included. <laughs> yeah. Which is, again, why they ended up rolling through conditional use for being in the downtown. And again, that's not impossible to get permits. We just wanted to point out where... Could we... I, I, I think that our studio falls within that definition. Could we respond to this by leaving that definition and, and, the, and the types of scenarios that Barb's talking about would fall within that and require conditional use? But could we add a painting studio as something that's a permitted use? Or could we separate studio from workshop? We have nightclubs well, as permitted uses here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say Just the rules were logical. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, yes, you're saying it would go, you'd put it under public assembly? Yeah. Uh, or is the, it otherwise? Yeah, I think in this case. Community facility? That was not really a public space. It's you, not a public you can space. have a, a lab and technical facility as a permitted use. A lab? I, I would be unclear where to put it. 
it might. Well, unless, since it meets technically our light manufacturing, we could leave it under industrial as a separate category. But yeah, I would probably end up leaving it under industrial, even though it kind of sounds strange that art is industrial, but industrial is generally the production of new. I would leave it there. I don't think it would make sense under public assembly. Um, but we certainly could go through and make a separate category for an art studio and then just define the art studio as specific to a limited range of what that art studio would be allowed to encompass. But I think yes. the difference comes up. That's why I suggested up. painting studio because that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, Self-limiting. And it's it's at least doing something to make the the regs more art friendly. Or a studio. That I mean, we could also we could try to define our studio further, but we're going to start to run into to problems and where it crosses into. Uh, then he's going to get somebody who wants to make jewelry. <laughs> Want you know wants the studio classification would still fall under that. Is there? Is it something that a lot of towns do to find art studio or? I've seen it in other in other communities, but I didn't find any that I liked. I didn't look as hard at that one. Um, we had had some folks do a public arts master plan and I kind of punted to them. Um, and they got back to me last week, which I haven't had a chance to really look through what they had sent back on what other communities do. But at this point, we had gotten it into the list of But I can certainly work on that without having us get too bogged down permanently in this. And it's just trying to get some direction of what people might like to see. I agree, yeah, it shouldn't fall under public assembly, but it doesn't sound like that's how they interpreted it anyway. Well, the, the recommendation was to sure. list it under public assembly. Right. right. I know. Which I don't think. No. Could be. I, I would be fine with defining and making it permitted use, but I don't know if that's. I would be fine with that too. If we make a new definition. If, if, we, def if yeah. we define it, it, you know. As what? Narrowly define a painting studio yeah. or art studio, and then if something is not an art, uh, it's not as. Having a without equipment, additional equipment, um, so that it would open it up a little bit so it's not just a painting studio. Yeah, and I mean, we, there's some other things we can add. I mean, John found this one from Washington State. That one from Toronto. Okay, yes, if you've I got a couple. It needs to be like that, narrowly defined. I think we work, if we focus on any like noxious impacts that we're worried about and identify those as opposed to, let's like not get into equipment or those specifics. Yeah, if you've got a good one in there, just forward that on to me and I'll put it in my, I'll, I'll make a recommendation because for, for those of you who haven't, who didn't get to experience the joys of <laughs> zoning, what I usually end up doing is is putting together a, a recommendation and you know they truly are just putting something on the table to start talking about. And if, you know, I, I try not to put any pride or anything in them they're designed to be starting points because it's easier to beat up something that's in front of you than it is to talk about things in the abstract so we'll put something down and we'll just pull it apart and if it doesn't work we'll start all over again and if we've got something that we think we can fix we'll fix it so a new category under industrial the definition yep and then it'll have a new definition i think the idea is that it'll be a painting studio otherwise light manufacturing unless John gives me something that really seems like it meets what we were trying to do. Um, so while we've got these um, use tables opened up, the last one on part two talks about um, in the residential area, it was grouped in as one and two family, three and four dwelling units, um, and multi-family dwellings. Um, and I'll get back to that in a separate list some later on. Um, what we had was somebody who had a three unit building, they were going to a four unit building, and they argued it was not a change of use. I would agree, because it's 
because it's in the same category. It is. So because it wasn't a change of use, that started to, you know, did you even enter into development? Um, and therefore, could we even regulate it? If you don't have enough density for the four units, does it not matter because you're already a permitted use? You, there is no change of use, and because there is no change of use, there's no zoning permit. Because there's no zoning permit, you don't have to meet the zoning permit requirements, including density. But isn't there another section that says that you can't add additional units that would make it non There are buckets. So you, your first bucket if it, when you do regulation, so the first bucket is this overall applicability statement, and in, in for zoning, it's the definition of development. Anything that is development needs a zoning permit, and you fall into that first bucket. And then we go through and say, except for these, and except for these, and except for these, these small things. So we've got this big bucket that, if you're in definition of development, including change of use. But if we've just said going from three to four units is not a change of use, then you don't go on to the next step. It's a big flow chart. So if you are the definition of development, then you have to get a permit. If it's not, then you don't. If you go from three to four units, that's not development. Therefore, you can, you can leave. You don't get to go and say, well, because we're regulating you down here, you therefore need a permit. That doesn't work that way. It, we have to actually get you to that regulation through the flow chart for you to actually have to meet that requirement. And so the issue we have is if it's not a change of use, you're not going to need a permit. If you don't need a permit, technically you don't have to meet the density to make that shift or meet the parking requirements or meet the site plan requirements or anything else. So what my recommendation here was that I just break this into different lines. So there's going to be a line for one dwelling unit, a line for two dwelling units, a line for three dwelling units, a line for four dwelling units, and a line for multifamily dwellings. Yeah, I mean, right now, you would be required to do something to go from two to three, but not three to four, which is Correct. very strange. That yes. doesn't really make any sense, <laughs> right? Well, there's, there's a whole slew of code differences in the code. A billing that, code, yes. yes. That get triggered in that case. Yeah, you would... I mean, I could certainly see separating three and four, but I mean, one and two are typically always lumped together in in building codes and most other codes. But this isn't the building code, so why are no, we I'm separating them all out? Like, why do we have multi, three, one, or two? We had just grouped them into places depending on where the permitted and the conditional uses would apply. You know, so if we were looking at residential nine, it's a permitted use, administrative permit for one and two family units. It's a conditional use for three and four units. Well, with this logic though, anything over five units is not, like going from five to 200 wouldn't be a change of use. And the other option that we have <laughs> is um, what we don't have in these regulations is a definition of change of use, which I have in my other zoning regulations which I actually have as a draft and so the other option to doing this is to have a definition of change of use which is what I usually do and within that it is a change of the intensity of use which would capture items like going from three to four units we would simply go and say well that's a change of intensity and therefore you need to get a permit for that because it is a change of use because it's a change of intensity in the same way that usually you talk about this in the context of rural communities and gravel pits that's your big one go from 10 average of 10 trucks a day to 12 oh, trucks oh, yes. a day is that a change of use um, and what if you have a kid now, what if you have a kid? Is that a change? <laughs> yes, that's a change, change, change of intensity. Yeah. Yeah. It has changed the density. Yeah. 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 Or um, just a so kid becomes a teenager. It seems it's like overall that it would be useful to have that definition in, in our ordinance anyway. So we could leave these, and I could just go through with it and give you guys a change of use definition that would kind of... I don't know. I don't like getting into this intensity thing. It seems like <laughs> just saying, including, like, increasing adding a housing unit in the definition of land development would be a lot easier to simpler. Although you could just say, like, this doesn't pass a straight face test. Like, 
Which I, I get a lot of yes, and I think in other communities I would be a lot more relaxed. I just it's just incredible in the the months that I've been here the the details that everybody's either an attorney or knows an attorney, and I get we get everybody nitpicking every little detail, including the fact that somebody did actually come in and tell me I don't need a permit to go three to four units. So this isn't hypothetical. This is an actual case, and I said appeal it to court. We're going to say you need a permit. So then we don't need to do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> that would involve getting more lawyers involved than are already involved. Have they, 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 just get a they haven't appealed it, but we're just trying to point out where people have found places where we kind of went, and, as Barb said, well, you know, I can see that that's not a change of use and they don't need a permit. Right. Except I mean, that. Because it, then does it start to overlap with our allowing single family the uh, single family units to be duplexed. It, well, we expressly describe that, which is why that's an easier case for us to to discuss. We clearly said this is okay, and they need a permit to do it. But this one started to fall into a strange gap because technically they were making the argument they didn't need a permit at all to do it. Is there a way to say, yeah, as you said, adding additional units is a change of use? Residential units. Yeah, I mean there are different ways to to, if we to fix to. this issue. I don't see this as a problem, but if we want to do it, then if you think we need to, I, that would be my. I'm just yeah, I'm like I said, I'm. Yeah, I guess just for my own learning, I know I'm starting at a very basic level, but what's the what's the problem if somebody with three units just adds a fourth unit without a permit? Because <laughs> well, they might do something that doesn't meet code? Uh, they, would be, they would be... Um, they would not be... If they were exempt from the zoning, they could do it without needing to meet the parking requirements. Oh. They could do it without meeting landscaping requirements because we have, if you're four, if you're a three or four unit, you should get a site plan. And generally, if you went from three to four units, we would ask for a site plan. So you would show us what the landscaping is and if there's any screening that would be necessary from the neighbors. And your, your point before is that they could be change into a non-conforming, um, you know, if they didn't have the lot size. And in, yeah, and in that case, they could also, because we aren't looking at it, they actually may only have amount of land sufficient for three units, and they want to go to four units, but if they're exempt, they can just go to four units, because I don't actually get any opportunity to veto that application, or to deny that application. I'm all for allowing this, making it as easy as possible, <laughs> also not for making like a mockery of this is <laughs> I think the, so, inti the intensity idea seems like it would mean more judgment calls for you, which is what you're trying to avoid. No, I mean, it's, it's clear we can go through when we put the definition of what a change of use is to go through, and you can even go through and say, for example, a change from three to four units. An additional unit would be a change of intensity. Um, increasing the number of truckloads of gravel would be a change of intensity. Uh, it starts to get into some of these other cases as well because there's also some structural things um, for some changes of use, you know, um, if you are expanding. Or what if we yeah, say a three to four unit without a change in the structure isn't a change of use, and then they're fine. Then you're really getting into, into details. I mean, it would be helpful to have a change of use definition because I know that this came up with the fire chief in relationship to... Um, an insertion of a, a business uh, and it ended up not qualifying as a change of use whereas if it had been then he would have had more purview yeah he's usually looking at building code though but and their still, definition of change of use but for us we're usually looking at it from but if it's slightly permitted different. if it's just permitted um, because we don't have a definition of a change of then, again, he may not get a chance to look at it in the same way. If it's permitted, you still need a permit. Yeah, well, maybe. Um, well, I mean, we could solve the problem by your comment before, John, is just to say additional units. 
um, residential units qualify as a change of use. Could or be. as land development. It's land development. Yeah, it's going back to the first. It could be another uh, note on our use table. We already have no, well, it would technically be up in the definition of development. Oh, the, all right. Okay. So, because we have to capture, we have to capture them first. So I'm clear, though, changing from one to two is, will not be affected by this. It would it's because still it's land still land development. So no because one and two be, are already? Right. And yes. one should be able to be denied regardless of the size of their lot to, be able to go from right. one to two. Okay. And but, and, but with three, we're going to clarify that three to four requires permit and you could be denied for a few factors. There are yeah, and a couple of conditional requirements, but only in res, only in the bigger ones. I think just adding a unit it qualifies as land development. So you're not you don't all of a sudden become like exempt from all of the zoning permits. <coughs> yeah, so just so everybody's kind of on the same page. So the what the definition, this is pretty similar to what's under state law. Land development mean, means constructing, installing, demolishing, reconstructing, converting, structurally altering, relocating or enlarging any structure, mining, excavation, filling, or grading of land, removing natural woody vegetation from within riparian buffers, changing or extending the use of land or a structure, adjusting or relocating the boundary between two lots or dividing a lot into two or more lots. You can put changing adding units in without use. doing any of those things. <laughs> right, Go changing ahead. or extending the use, isn't, wouldn't that, yeah. wouldn't adding a fourth unit be changing or extending the use? Or does that yeah, matter? or a conversion? Uh, except in, in this definition, uh, oh, changing or extending the use of land or a structure. The question was, is that changing the use of the land if it's not changing? It's not changing, it's extending. Uh, How's that it define? could be. Yeah, I mean, if, I think there's room for us to make the argument, and I think some, I think it would be hard pressed for the court, but at the same time, the courts can do funny things, and if we know we've got an area that's gray, that's why we kind of pointed out should we clean that up or should we just leave it? I mean, as we said, we could put in here either in the definition of changing of use. Or we could just add a specific comment that just says to increase adding another unit. Fine with clarifying it there. Yeah, so adding it to the land development definition. Yeah. Clarifying it in the land development definition. I think we can trust Mike's wisdom. We don't have to like go over the semantics of what exactly it should say. Mm -hmm. Well, you all get your second shot at it because whatever we get, I can propose. Throw an art studio in there. Throw an art studio in there. And there we go. You can't. Except that all art studios shall be exempted from this. Yes. So these. Studios must be in the right area. <laughs> so if you, if you didn't get a permit, say this thing goes through and this guy has a, or woman has a four unit building, when they go to sell, would they have any negative consequences when they go to sell? Just no, because it's not a violation of the zoning. So it technically wouldn't be. So they would just sorry. sort of become a non-conforming. Or maybe they were already non-conforming. It would basically become non-conforming. Okay. Yeah. Because it would be legally non-conforming. It exists legally, and it doesn't conform to the zoning because of a loophole. So we're creating more, non potentially creating more non-conforming. Um, Lots. Yeah, so, and yeah, so the definition right. the definition of development is always really important um, because it is the gateway that gets you into the zoning, and once you're in, then we can start to manage what's in there. Um, and occasionally we've had questions uh, come up that we really had to go and reflect hard on that. Um, I was working with the town of Elmore, and they had somebody who was building houseboats, and people were living in the houseboats. Well, the issue is they float, and we're talking about land development, and therefore it actually didn't need a zoning permit for people to build houseboats and lived in them in Lake Elmore because it's not land development, it's water development, and therefore we couldn't regulate it through the zoning. 
also Elmore had people landing airplanes on the lake, and for the same reason we could not regulate because it wasn't landing on land, it we could not, airstrip. it was not an airstrip, it was it was landing in water, and because as long as it was landing in water, it was not within our jurisdiction. Was it the state's jurisdiction? It ended up being the state's jurisdiction, but it was, as I was working for Lamoille County at the time, the questions were coming in from the town, well, can't we do anything about these people living in houseboats? And the we look- protection, all of that, maybe this is before that. <laughs> Yeah, and that may, well, so some of these things may have triggered <laughs> why, they created, those why they created some of these new rules because people were creatively finding ways that they could get around certain rules by. What if you lived in a Technically, that would be a structure then. What if you put water under it? What if you put water under it? Yes. Yes. What if you put it in a swimming pool? If it's water, I don't think it counts as fill. <laughs> yes. If you build a, build a pool, put the houseboat in it, <laughs> technically we could regulate the pool, but not the houseboat. Uh, and you can be within the floodplain because we have not been fill. Perfect. You're here above the Yeah. <laughs> and you're above the flooding. <laughs> yes. You've given people horrible ideas. Really? I'm waiting for yeah. the applications to come rolling in. But that's, that's a lot of when we start talking about these things, we look at them, and, and as I talk to my zoning administrators and new ones as they come in, we talk about buckets. And it, you have to fall into the first bucket to get to the next bucket to get to the next bucket. Um, and then when we had talked earlier, um, Brandy had proposed a lot of architectural standards that were there. And the question that we had as administrators were, when do these apply? We have rules. Just because the rules are there doesn't mean we apply them. We actually have to find a place where the rules say, at this point, you now have to enforce those rules. And in this case, we've attached them to major site. renovations in the major site plan. So um, it, the thinking of it as, as buckets, this one gets into this one, then from this one, is it site plan, is it conditional use, is it multiple, so. I mean, this is really helpful in terms of having actual examples of people who are making applications. Mm -hmm. and we're going to have to see how our, our rules work. Do one more. Keep doing a couple more here. Yeah, there's some. And part them. three, some easy ones. Um, these are just changing some headers. They were, they were labeled as standards. They really weren't, or they were uh, labeled as applicability, and they're really not applicability statements. They were actually standards. So um, your applicability is your who needs to meet this requirement? And your standards are what standard do you have to meet? And it was labeled as one and really was the other. Um, 3002A, reword the proposed development will be or was approved as a PUD in accordance with the provisions of 440 or under the uh, previous set of zoning regulations. Um, so this particular one, I don't have what it currently reads as, but that's what it was proposed to change as. This came up because of, uh, we have a permit in place, um, going through the process right now from Murray Hill, which is a PUD. And the question came up, how do we process permits for PUDs? Um, the proposed development will be or was approved as a planned unit development in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 440. So I think that it currently reads the proposed land development shall be approved as a planned unit development. Yes, and so what this is saying is it's it's still okay. Murray Hill is okay, even though the way that's worded it. Because it was under a previous. It set was under of a previous set of zoning regulations. So this is really just kind of a technical okay. fix. Yeah. Is that the yellow ones that you had? We're not color coded. Yeah, this I time. didn't color code them this time. I, I should go through and color code more of these. Um, uh, point C, remove buildable areas from the density calculations, has turned into a nightmare for administration because we lack slope maps with a table to tell us how much land is in the slope category for the purposes of calculating the number. Staff has had to send every subdivision request to add dwelling units to an engineer for slope, uh, for slope analysis. Um, staff recommends expanding some of these areas from, uh, to exempt from the analysis to include some areas of higher density, including urban, uh, already urban center riverfront and MUR are exempt, consider 1,503,000 or others. So 
Oh. So the issue. So the LiDAR map is not really giving you an accurate enough. Oh, it's giving us a very accurate map, but the issue is if you look at a parcel with those lines, and I said, how much of that property is over 30%? I mean, just pick any parcel on that map. There's no specific that's one there. It's, it's everything that's in red is over 30%. Yes, so, yeah. but we can't. But, I mean, yes, I mean, in a computer program, that would be very easy to do. And It's not very easy to do. In fact, Central Vermont can't do it. Thank you. UVM can't do it. We have officially stumped everybody. We, we don't have a table, and we can't do it for, for all of these. We just need, we, we, we can't do it. We haven't been able to figure out how to do this yet, and it's really been Amazed. stumping us. It's not too complicated. Um, part of the problem when I tried doing some of this is that our parcel data, um, a lot of, uh, what may look nice, a lot of the lines don't either cross, so there's gaps, so when you run it, it kind of just breaks breaks the model. So it's um, the property lines that become an issue? Well, the, the short amount of time I tried doing it, that's the first problem I encountered. Um, the, I think the city will be updating their parcel data to meet the state standard this year. I think we're a year from now. So we'll be able to do that. But if there are maybe specific parcels And, and when we get in tight, the other issue that starts to come up is that that doesn't exempt, that picks up a lot of stuff that's noise. So it will show 30% slopes at the edges, it over roofs. And on retaining walls and rock walls, and so we end up with some odd areas that end up being defined as more than 30% slope. We've been able to kind of work around for a number of these cases and get it to work, but slopes are gonna come up a second time later on as well, but that's just one of the <laughs> options was, because um, it has been expensive, um, every single change of residential use, you know, we, we, we try to be easy. Let's take single family homes and duplex. So that, that's, that one is allowed based on that one exemption we put in there. But as we start going to some of these other added development unit, you have to hire an engineer to do the slope analysis. When you get down to these smaller parcels. Are you saying for new, con for adding on yeah. to an existing building? So for example, Bob Gowans on Main Street, he's around the, just around the corner past the school as so you start going up the hill. He's on the right-hand side. He wanted to, to subdivide to put in another unit. He needed to hire an engineer to put in a slope analysis um, because the map that's here showed a lot of stuff that was over 30%, and it turns out a lot of the stuff over 30% was his house. His house is actually a retaining wall. It's mm -hmm. high on this side, and he's got a walkout basement on the other side, so this is all 30% slopes, but it's not. It's his house is basically the retaining wall. So he had to have pay for an engineer to do that analysis. The neighbor is also trying to do the same thing. Most of that one is also over 30%. And that one, they had to hire an engineer. There was a subdivision on Spring Hollow. They had to hire an engineer because they, you know, we could look at this and we could by our eye go and say, I don't think this is you know, I can guess it's it's not going to, they're going to have enough density to is develop. Is there a way to exempt the, um, you know, steep slopes that are falling uh, inside existing structures? I mean, that's your point, right? Uh, yeah, it just becomes a very complicated, it's not as easy of an idea as you, as you might think when you look at this to go and say, oh, just remove the buildable area that's over 30%. It almost always involves hiring an engineer to do the analysis to make that determination. So what seemingly appear to be simple projects. But maybe they're not simple projects because it's a 30% slope. You know, that... Um, but we're not even talking about whether it 
is structurally, any structures or building retaining walls or making it developable to make it work. We haven't even gotten to that part yet. This is just whether you have the density. Can you use that land that's over 30% and count it towards your density to allow you to have a three unit building rather than a duplex? Yes. For every 1,500 square feet, for every 1,500 square feet you own, in residential 1500, you get another development unit. And so 1500 square feet's not a whole lot of area. And if you're close, we really need to know whether you have the land. We know you have the parcel big enough, but now we have to start excluding steep slopes. So are you talking about within an existing structure, not, at, not as part of new construction, not adding up? No additions you're just yeah within within existing structures if you wanted to just go and add another unit or you wanted to take a garage and take your garage and put another unit over you got a duplex with a garage you're going to put a unit in the garage you're going to go from a two unit to a three unit well we need to calculate density and we have to look at the steep slopes and we get into this I'm sorry i have to leave i have it's a hard, hard deadline <laughs> So that's where these things come up, and we just have to keep going back. And that's that's the hard part that we keep coming up is just, and, and this is going to come up again. This isn't the only time slopes come up. Slopes come up for the unbuildable slopes later on when we get to 3007 as well. So it's actually number 32, a little bit farther down. So maybe we'll hold off a decision here till we get there, but this is a separate one. Do we count land over 30% towards your density? Yeah. Yeah. We can all think about it. You know, but again, is it if part of that 30 percent falls within the footprint of the existing structure? Can that be? Yeah, we haven't been counting yet. We we have been saying that's not 30 percent slow. Okay. All right. But it shows up on the map, which is why the map becomes useless pretty quick. But outside the footprint. Outside of the, the footprint, it is, does. Is pretty evident in terms of a, being a different situation. Um, uh, no, nope, we no, still have four. Oh, <laughs> uh, we have to minutes? consider minutes first. Should we consider the, okay. Uh, or we can hold them to minutes. We, does everyone have a chance to look at the minutes from June 25th? I don't think we have a copy of the May 14th ones here. I, I looked at them forever ago, I think. Uh, I would have to bring them back in. I didn't print out new copies of the May. I wasn't paying attention. Can we, can we just approve both at once? Okay. It's your I'm motion. That I'll second. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Approved. We have another motion. For maybe. Make a motion to adjourn. Yes. Okay. Stephanie All and in favor. John, and that's it. <laughs>